back from a run in the wintry mountains in North Carolina. And what I'm gonna share with you here is kind of a snippet of what I shared uh, last week in the Run Elite membership group. And I want you guys to be able to have some benefit here. And um, I'm not gonna do the entire training here, but I do wanna share with you one exercise that can really change the game for you. Welcome to the live Victoria, it's good to see you. And what we're gonna talk about here is strength. So I'm going to preface this a little bit for you and then I'm gonna show you one exercise. And if you can, tell you what, if you can guess, hey Sandy, um, before I actually bring out the apparatus here, tell you what, if you can guess, you get one guess, if you can guess what the exercise is before I tell you, then I'm gonna send you a free pair of socks. So go ahead and type in the chat below if you wanna play along with that. And if you get it right, first person to get it right, one person will get a free pair of socks. Uh, so. I will repeat that in a second. Sandy, Victoria, hey, it's good to see you. Um, but you do have a hint here, it is an apparatus. All right, let's dive into this here. And uh, what we're talking about is, you know, strength. So what do you do when you're a runner, a distance runner, and you maybe want to develop some strength and you go maybe to the weight room? Uh, it's kind of like, oh no, not weights. A lot of runners really hate doing weights. But we do a lot of things that are a band, great guess, that is not it though. Um, a, a band is actually really great, uh, especially for rehabilitation. We can talk about that in another video, but that is an excellent guess. Thank you for uh, playing, Victoria. If you guess again and nobody else gets it, I might just give you those socks. But what, what do we do? It's like, what about a bench press? If I get my bench press up, I'm gonna be a better runner, right? And we kind of think the answer is no, so we don't do bench press. The answer actually is maybe, because there is a carryover effect Angela, good to see you on here. Banded squats, that is an excellent guess. It's actually one of the five things that we can do, but it's not the number one. Great, great guess there. We can talk about that too. Um, so what do we do? If we don't do bench press, what about chin-ups? What about you know quad extensions? There's all these things we can do, all these strength exercises. Now really, it's almost a trick question. I'm not gonna fool you here too much. This is not the answer we're going for, but the real answer is hill sprints. Because hill sprints are strength, that are very specific for running because you're actually running and there's resistance there. But assuming we're not talking about hill sprints, let's just talk about strength in the weight room. What is it? Well, let's look at, what I'm gonna do is try to speak loudly here so you can hear me. And I'm gonna back up and show you some motions that we do when we're running that are very subtle. Okay, we're gonna go through a couple of body parts and then you'll understand why we're doing this exercise and I'll show you the one exercise and how to do it. So when you're running, look at me from the side here, Look at, let's take a look at my back first, okay? So when you run, you have a lean that happens at the ankles. I know you can't see my ankles, but you lean forward at the ankles and everything else is straight. Whoops. There's a really cool picture I posted back in the fall, if you scroll, of a mannequin in a Target store running and they have this straight line. That's what you want. You don't wanna lean forward at the, at the hips. If you do that, you're gonna get tight back, tight hamstrings. Stacy, welcome. Angela, box jumps, that is so excellent. I would classify box jumps as a plyometric exercise, not strength, because uh, you need to be powerful to do them, not necessarily strong. You can be very strong and suck at box jumps. Um, that is really good. That's a very high level thing. And um, yeah, it's plyometric exercise. We're talking about basically just functional strength here. So you guys are gonna get it. It's actually kind of a weird one here, but once you hear it, you it's probably gonna put some bells off and you're gonna say, oh yeah, I've heard of that. I've just never done it. <laughs> Trust me, this is gonna be good. So let's talk about this. I'm not gonna um, read comments for a minute here just so I can say this, but feel free to type them and I'll get back to you. So your back, what are you doing when you're running? Well, you're leaning slightly forward at the, at the ankles, so the back is contracted, but it's not moving, okay? That's called isometric. You don't have to worry about that. It's tight, it's supportive, but it's not moving. So we wanna have an exercise that use, uses the lower back in a very small range of motion, either none or, or just kind of small. It's not a huge, extension like this, okay? So back, what about your core? How are you using your abs? Well, I mean, other, there are other muscles in your core, including your lower back, but let's talk about kind of abdominals here. Now, a lot of people do crunches, and crunches are using the rectus abdominis, and you're kind of moving like this. That's not really functional for running. A plank would be a better exercise, and a plank is one of the top five you should do. It's not the number one, though. A plank is great because you contract, while not moving much, which is what you're doing when you're running. 
there's motion happening here, but there's not motion happening here at the stomach, right? So what you want for the core is tight, very tight, but not much motion. And here's a key one. When you're running and, you and you're standing on one foot, your body wants to naturally turn, but you don't let it. So you use your, uh, your obliques to, to uh, counteract that rotation. So that's key number one. We want to engage the obliques. We want to engage the, the stomach and the back, but without too much motion. Now let's look at, we're going to look at the lower legs now. <clears throat> what happens with your hip when you're running? Well, you flex the hip and that takes active contraction of a muscle. And then you don't really have to extend the hip much. You just kind of let it fall. And then when your leg is on the ground, now you extend the hip and you use your glutes, right? So there is gonna, we want to achieve this position here, but we don't want to do it with resistance because that's not what we do when we run. There's not resistance against your knee, aside from the weight of your leg. So we want to achieve this position here. Look at the angle here, here. We got to achieve that, but we want to work the glutes instead because this is largely a passive motion when you're running. And when your foot touches the ground, now you are moving the hip backwards. And so that's activating the glutes. We want to use the glutes from the range of motion of straight up to slightly back like that. Just engage them here, very tight. All right. <clears throat> um, there are some other things too. Those are the main ones, right? So we see the core, we see the abs, the rotational component, we see the hip motion, the glutes. Ah, here's another one is your quads. Now, if you do deep squats, squats are great for running and I do recommend them. They're also one of the top five you want to do, but they're not number one. Here's why. When you go down into a full squat, so I will uh, move this here. When you go down into a full squat, look at how much range of motion there is. You go down, and yes, you're strengthening your quads, but this isn't functional for running because you don't move that much when you run. You really only land and have a little bit of knee bend and then push off. So we want to work your quads in a small range of motion like that. Does that make sense? There are other things too. Let's kind of stop there and review. So we, we know what we want to do with our abs, with our back, with our glutes, with our hips, and with our quads. What exercise does that? Here it comes. Any last guesses here? You get a pair of socks, box jumps. I think those, that was the last guess here. So these are really great answers, by the way. We can uh, do another training on these if you guys like. Here's the answer. I'm going to pick it up. Here is your apparatus, it's called the kettlebell. And the exercise that you wanna do, you can do lots of things with kettlebells. Now, I used to think that a kettlebell was just a weight with a handle on it. And I was very wrong. You can do things with kettlebells, hey Ray, welcome, that you can't do with other things. Like you can do the exercise, the number one exercise, here it is, is the kettlebell swing. Now, I'm gonna quickly demonstrate the kettlebell swing then I'm gonna come back and tell you how it matches up with everything we just talked about, about the strength that you want to achieve, the ranges of motion you want to achieve. And then I'm gonna go back and walk you through how to do a kettlebell swing the correct way. Most people do it incorrectly. It's very important, okay? It is, I'm gonna come up close to the camera here for emphasis. It's very important that a kettlebell swing be done with proper form. Because if you do it with poor form, you're going to, number one, hurt your back. Who wants that? And number two, you're not going to get the main benefit of the kettlebell swing. So let's review. First, I'm gonna demo this, then we're gonna break it down. Here's how a kettlebell swing goes. Now you've seen this before, probably. My Wi-Fi is cutting in and out. There we go. The Wi-Fi is cutting in and out, but I think you guys, uh, there we go. Okay, sorry for that, if it cut out for a second. Now you've seen a kettlebell swing before. It kind of goes, kind of goes like this. Okay. Notice what's happening. Let's break it down here. So the things that are happening when you kettlebell swing like that are, you're, it looks like you're picking a weight from the ground and swinging it up. That is not what you're doing. What you're doing is two things. You're doing a deadlift and then you're using your momentum to swing it out. So here is the first part of the kettlebell swing. When you pick it up, you just stand up like this. 
Notice that my, I'm gonna move the camera down a little. Look at my legs, I'm not doing a squat. This is the first place where most people kind of screw it up is they do a squat. So this is incorrect. It would be incorrect to squat down. You see my knees squat down? Don't do that. It all happens at the hips right here. So it happens just at the hips and you keep a straight back. Look at my back. It's not curved. I don't use my arms. Arms are just hanging and back is straight. See that straight back, straight back. And knees are slightly bent, but it's not a squat just slightly bent. And then you stand up. This is the first part of the squat, ready? You stand up. And notice what happens when I stand up, watch my hips. This is a hip thrust. And what you're doing here is you're engaging the glutes and you're engaging your core. I'll show you how to engage the core. But look at this, this is a glute exercise. If you just stand up using your back and don't engage your butt, you're not gonna get the benefit. You want to squeeze with the butt and really thrust forward like this, watch. So it is not a squat, it happens at the hips. And watch what happens here, ready? It's just forward. And there's maximum engagement right here, right? It's just forward like that. Now there's resistance because I'm holding a weight. Now when you do it hard enough, you're gonna do this. When you stand up, that momentum is gonna carry the weight forward and you just move at the arms. And the arms come back down, and when they get here, now you hinge at the hips again. And you thrust, and you let it glide until you hinge at the hips. So what a lot of people are gonna do is they're going to go up, and then they're gonna start to lean forward. Don't do that. That is very bad for your back. The motion is just karate chop here, karate chop at the hips, at the hips. That's it. You'll protect your back, and you're gonna engage your glutes. And now, you wanna do it with force, with a lot of force. And the reason is because you're gonna engage your core. So when you're running, you're engaging your core with rotation, your anti-rotation, and we'll talk about that in a second. But really what you're doing is just engaging the core without much motion. So when you swing, you want to shoo, shoo. You wanna have a tight engagement of the core. And it's very functional for your running. So. You're gonna exhale forcefully and contract here while also contracting here, like this, watch. So, you bring it up. When you do your swing, notice there's maximum contraction going on here and here, ready? All right. Now the final way that you can do this is do a one-handed swing. Now the reason you do a one-handed swing is because, look, my heart rate is up just from that. This is a very intense exercise that is really beautiful. You can do it actually every day. You don't need to do it every other day. You can actually do it every day. I'll tell you why after I show you the one-handed swing. Why do a one-handed swing? Because I'm gonna face you now. If I'm doing this exercise facing you, everything, I have my weight on two legs and everything is balanced, right? When you let go with one hand and you have just one hand, now there's a tendency for that weight to pull you like this. So what you have to do to stay straight is engage your core and your uh, oblique, oblique abdominals so that you rotate back here. So what you're doing with one handed is you're getting the same benefit with the glutes, with the quads, with your back, but your back and your, and your abs are now using a slight twisting stabilization, which is exactly what you want when you're running. So if I were running and I were on one foot, my body's gonna wanna start to twist. So actually, to keep it the same as a one-handed kettlebell swing, if you were on this foot, your body would wanna start to twist. And you have to rotate yourself to stay moving forward. So, notice this, here's a two-handed swing coming at you. Now, if I go to one-handed, there's a tendency to twist, you see that? So you have to engage to stay forward. And now, it's using your, your rotators in your abs as well. So a two-handed swing and then one-handed swings are the best exercise that you can do. Now here's a couple of, um, of extra bonuses for you. Why is it the best exercise? Well, we know that it's engaging everything very functionally. It's even engaging your quads. You're doing a slight squat, it's very slight, it's only about 10 to 15 degrees, 
And guess what? When you run, your knee is only bending about 15 degrees, 30 degrees really at the most, unless you're going uphill. So it's very functional. But second is this. What's a good weight? Great question. I'll come right back to that. Um, it's actually higher than you would think. Here's why. This exercise is much different than anything else that you're doing. If you get on a machine and you do squats or leg extensions, what you're doing is you're fighting the weight against gravity. You're fighting it. You're pushing it. And if you do it a lot or too much, it's going to break the muscle down. You're going to get really sore. That's what delayed onset muscle soreness, right? And you have to basically will yourself and push. When you're running, you're not really willing yourself and pushing like that. If you use will and push, it's, be, it's more of a mental thing. It's more of a metabolic thing. It's not really the muscles so much until you're at the end of a race. So with a kettlebell swing, it's, called, it's what we call a ballistic exercise. Ballistic means that it's kind of, it's functional. It's kind of bouncing back and forth. It's dynamic and it changes direction just like when you're running. So if you do a squat, it's not very close to what you do when you run. You go down, you kind of stop, you come up, you kind of stop. When, when you're running, it's a constant back and forth. There's momentum going, there's swinging, there's changes in direction, right? And it's those changes in direction, right when you change moving direction, that the muscles really get activated. And where if they're weak, it's really going to come out. So a ballistic exercise like this, has you change direction again and again and again and again. So it's very functional. And the beauty here is that if you do it with proper form, you're not going to get sore unless you do, you know, maybe too much, <laughs> but you can do this exercise. I've done it every single day since December 29th. I haven't missed a single day. And, um, we, let's talk about weight now. So the one that I have right here is 25 pounds. This is not enough weight. I'll do a lot of swings. I'll do 100 or 200 swings with this. Um, it's not a lot. You want to go up higher. This is the only one I have at my house. So I go to the gym and use higher weights. Now, how much weight to use? When you first start, the number one thing is your first one or two times doing kettlebell swings is, hey, Dick, welcome to the call. You don't want to use much weight at all. And the reason is because you want to practice form. It's very important. Now, I'm going to demonstrate really poor form for you again. Really poor form would look like bending at the knees and leaning forward like this and just trying to swing the weight. Very poor form. You're not going to get the benefit. You turn it into a uh, stress on your back an upper body exercise and, uh, and a quad squat. It's not what you want. When you do it with proper form, when you hinge at the hips and then thrust forward and hinge at the hips, when you do that, you have a lot, a lot of power. These are the biggest muscles in your body, your glutes, your quads, and your back. It's called the quadratus lumborum. And then your glute maximus is one of the biggest ones. And the four quad muscles are huge, right? These are the biggest muscles you have. You can tax them a lot. You can do very heavy weight. So, uh, Kristen, to answer your question, when you start, start with 20 pounds just to get the feel for it. Then go up to 25 and do 10 to 20 swings. If you're doing more than 20 swings in a row, you should up the weight, okay? Now here's your prescription. You're gonna do that for at least your first two or three times doing this exercise so that you, you can tell if your form is right. You'll know your form is off if your back starts to hurt. Hey Jen, welcome to the call. If your low back is hurting, don't go up in weight, go back and work on form. It means that you're bending at the, you're rounding at the back and using your arms as opposed to hinging at the hip, okay? Your back is completely protected when you hinge and you use your glutes. And you'll know this, so start with the weight low until you know that your form is good and then what you wanna do is actually go up to a pretty heavy weight. I suggest um, nobody here is, is unable to do a 35 pound. That should really be the minimum. Most everybody here, can do a 45 pound and that's still pretty low. And even my girlfriend, who is, a, who is much smaller than I, and, uh, and I'm a pretty small guy, right? Even her, she's doing, um, we did it together two days ago and she was doing 55 pounds. 
And she was doing them for sets of, she did a 20 set of 25, which was incredible. I'm like, wow, girl, you're really strong. So even the most petite person here can work up to 55 pounds, no problem. Okay, that's your range. Your range is do, learn form with just 20 pounds and 25, and then your minimum should really be 35, and that range can be 35 to about 55. And if you go beyond that, um, it's because you've been doing this for a long time and you're very strong, okay? Now, how many reps do you wanna do? Uh, Daniel, you're welcome. How many reps? Okay, this is, this is some high level stuff here. Now, I'm gonna do another training for you guys just on weight training and like all the kinds of weight training and how to prescribe the amount of reps that you want and it's not what you think. We think, right, that power lifters wanna do heavy weight, low reps, and that endurance runners wanna do lower weight, lots of reps, and that's not true. Lower weight, lots of reps, you might as well run. And that works really well for rehabilitating an injury, but not for gaining strength. For gaining strength, here's the prescription, and uh, don't read too much into this, because this is kinda complicated, I'm just gonna tell it to you, and then I'll tell you what to do with the kettlebell swing, okay? Here's the prescription. Whatever your maximum is at a given weight, so let's say you could, you could squat 150 pounds and you could do it 10 times, okay? So we know it's a max, not because it's the max amount of weight, because we know what the max amount of reps at a certain weight is. So with 150 pounds, you can do 10. Let's just say that. What you wanna do is you wanna have 30 to 60% of your maximum reps, not your maximum weight. Whatever the weight is, do 30 to 60% of your maximum rep. Now that is a protocol to get stronger if you want to really build a certain muscle. What we're doing here is kind of that, but we want to build a little bit of muscular endurance. And so you don't need to, uh, the weight that you want is something that you could swing for between 10 and 20 swings. If you're doing more than that, it's, it kind of becomes a cardiovascular exercise and that's great. With this weight here, 25 pounds is pretty light for a swing. So like I said, I'll do 100 swings. And that's it for a different effect. I'm doing it for like a cardio, uh, a specific cardio event, cross training. But not for pure strength, okay? For pure strength, I'm gonna go up to 55 pounds or 60 pounds, and I'm gonna do sets, uh, I'm gonna do sets of 10, maybe 12. And the, the reason I know that that's the correct amount is because if I were fresh and strong, I could do about 25 to 30 of those before I was just tapped out and my form goes to shit, right? So I cut that, you wanna do about one third to two thirds of what your maximum reps are. For most people here, you're gonna pick a weight, like I say, between 35, 55 pounds and you're gonna do sets of about 10 to 20. It's basically gonna work for everybody here, all right? The way that you're gonna mess yourself up is if it's way too heavy and you'll notice this really quick, when it's heavy and you get to um, 10 reps, now your form is gonna start to diminish and you're gonna feel really like you have to use effort to swing that thing up. That's no good, you stop. You have to do this with proper form and the proper form is maximum engagement of the glutes. I'll show it one more time here for you guys and I want you to look very closely. When you can't do this anymore, you have to stop and take a long break. A long break might be 15 minutes. And you could go do something else. You could, uh, you know, do some dumbbell curls or jog or box or jump rope. Do something totally different. You gotta wait a pretty long time and come back just like your hill sprints. And you wanna come back ready to go. And it looks like this. <clears throat> it looks like this. Let's bring this down a little. The main thing you're looking for is am I hinging at the hips? And am I. In it keeps cutting out. Sorry, guys. Am I hinging at the hips? And am I using my glutes? Ready? You tell me, am I? Look at the snap in the butt. It's not coming up slowly, it's a boom, it's hard, right? So it's use the glutes. And this is kind of funny and I'll leave you with this. This is your final tip. In order to really engage the glutes, you wanna pretend like someone's coming up behind you and they're gonna kick you in the butt. So I'm gonna take this off of here now. Hopefully I'll get a better reception just holding this. You wanna pretend like someone is gonna come up behind you and just like kick you right in the butt. And when you, if, if that were true, you would clench really, really tight. That's what you want. You wanna 
and engage the glutes and engage your core. When you do that, you're gonna have a lot of strength gain. Now look, there's a couple of people in the, uh, the membership area who are doing this with a lot of success right now. We've got uh, Gene doing this, we've got Ron doing this, we've got Nathan doing this, and I'm doing it. Like I said, I do it, I've done it every day for almost a full month now, and the strength gains are amazing. I took about two months off from, I'll get that light out of your face, two months off from running for an injury, and I just did this, and I'm back running now, and it's like, there's no problem. I gotta work my endurance up a little bit again, but the strength, it's no problem. This stuff is great. It will move the needle for you, and the beauty is you can do it all the time. You can make it part of your daily routine. And so your strength is gonna go whoop. The reason you can do that is it has a very low risk of injury and it doesn't um, kill your muscles. It doesn't hurt your muscles in the way that pressing and pulling does. It's swinging, it's ballistic. So uh, let's see any other questions you have. This is great, thank you. You're welcome, Daniel. I'm glad that you're here and getting something out of this. Jen, what's a good weight? We covered that. This is definitely an exercise I wanna do to my routine, add to my routine. Right now, I only have a 15 pound kettlebell. Will get a heavier set when I have free capital, okay. And Tony, uh, welcome to the call. Yep, 15 pounds uh, is not really made for swings. When you have 15 pounds, it's made for other exercises, upper body, military presses, whatever, right? It's a great thing to have. Um, you really wanna have at least a 35, if not 45, and 55. Uh, for me, I use a 25 for warm-ups, uh, 45 for swings, and then a 55 or 60 for um, heavier swings. All right, so you wanna get one of those, just get resourceful. Um, I know that they're not cheap, they're like 70 to 100 bucks a piece if you buy them new. You can get them, use them at your gym, you can get them used. Um, you can swing a cat litter box on a string. <laughs> you can get resourceful here. Um, don't let money stand in the way there. If running is important enough to you, I know um, it's a resource, right? But what's important to you? Just ask yourself, is running important enough for me to, uh, to invest 100 bucks? If it is, go get yourself one. If not, you can swing. My girlfriend, I told you, she's really resourceful. I love this. Uh, she was, told me she used to swing a cinder block. You could put a rope on a cinder block. I don't reckon, it's not as safe, okay? But she did it and she was fine. <laughs> You can get resourceful. All right, I'm gonna leave you guys with that. Uh, Victoria, definitely adding this into my workouts. Great. If you guys wanna know more about this, uh, if you guys have any questions on the membership area, there's a Run Elite training area that I have. You can PM me, you can type here you're interested if you are and I'll get in touch with you or you can just PM me either at Run Elite or at Andrew Snow and I will reach out to you uh, in there. This was inspired from a training I did in there where we talk about the five exercises that if you did those five only, um, it would basically cover all of your bases for everything. You would really never need to do anything else unless it were for rehabilitation for runners. Uh, that training is in there. I wanted you guys to at least have a part of that training. Uh, so all my best to you guys. Thank you so much for being part of this group and we will do another live next week. Again, if you're interested in the membership area at all, you can comment here or you can just PM me and I'll share some details with you. Otherwise, um, you know, comment here if you have any other questions. Thank you again. Thank you. I'm so happy to be um, leading this group here and you guys really kick some ass. So go celebrate and have a great, what's today? Tuesday.